You mentioned that uh, there is a de facto hierarchy between MPs, MLAs, MLCs and that the state tends to overwrite the local bodies and yet we have uh, the NCR or the National Capital Region which seems to encompass multiple states, multiple municipal organizations and as best we sitting far away from Delhi know it seems to work in a fashion. Does that suggest that there is room to create other such organizations uh, say for example between Mumbai, Pune and make that a western metropolitan region say or, or whatever makes sense. The question is how does the NCR work in the light of what you've been saying has been all the things that are wrong. Just one second, can I have your name? I did announce I'm it. sorry, I didn't get your name. Prakash Hebalkar. Do you want me to respond to yes, this question? Or, or you can get a collection, the choice is yours. Because I don't want the answers to become longer than questions. <laughs> they have to be. No, maybe we can take two or three years. Sure. Yeah. Okay. My name is Krishan Khanna. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I have a question. How do you look at the future considering what you have shown us is the past? How do you think things will change because <coughs> From what you have said, I don't see much happening in the next 10 years at least. This is my personal observation based on your presentation. Good evening, I'm Anay Jogadekar. My question is, is in one of the slides, uh, there is, was a classification of uh, metropolitan cities as per the GDP, contribution of GDPs to the various sectors. Has there been any uh, such classification of our metro cities uh, as per the number of people employed in those particular sectors? And if yes, can you, do you believe that in, though we call our uh, metro cities, many of the people or large majority of people are involved in occupations that are non-metro or maybe they are a secondary or primary level occupations and what is the future in this regard? Okay, all right. Let me take these three. Let me <clears throat> take them in the reverse order. Uh, employment figures are rather sketchy and also because of the so-called informal sector and uh, we do not have very satisfactory answers except for some, some, some districts. So I think where the jobs are going, where the jobs are coming from, where they are located and how do you pursue that, you know, this is a very major problem of forecasting. And uh, even the international experience is not very, very clear. You try to be as dynamic and proactive as possible and somehow respond to the situations as they, as they emerge. But it looks like that in our metropolitan area, if we feel that the manufacturing sector as such is not going to bring the new jobs and it is going to be something else, then what are those jobs and what are the requirements in terms of skills and space and this and that and so on, uh, we are still not very, very clear. This is, this is one, one major issue. But nevertheless, it looks like that we are a little better off uh, than before uh, as a result of the NSS and other studies. Therefore, the question is, how do you see the future? I see the future as uh, uh, a series of compulsions from which we cannot uh, get away from. One is the compulsion of finding the jobs. Because uh, without getting into a debate about migration and agricultural development, agriculture is not going to give us the future jobs. We all know that. And therefore, it is the non-agricultural occupations. The question is, where do we find those occupations? And do we find them in the farm itself or is it off-farm? 
One of the interesting things that I noticed, if you take those districts of India which are agriculturally forward, in other words, those districts which contribute more than 1% to India's wheat and rice production, you know, whether it is Hisar or Bardwan or, you know, Kakinada or districts like that, their levels of urbanization is higher than the state average, okay? So it is not a question anymore of poverty and destitution driving urbanization. It's a question of more income. That will be the future driver of urbanization and therefore the jobs, you know, will have to follow that. So I, I look upon that as a very, very important compulsion. The second is the political compulsion also. Okay, we have had this in Narega. All sorts of stories are written about Narega. Economists argue whether it is sensible at all to hold people in the farm by giving a big subsidy because left to themselves they would migrate and they would make a more real contribution than just getting a state subsidy. But notwithstanding that, the fact is Narega is putting a lot of money in panchayats. The sarpanches are counting real money in more senses than one. And you find that the MLAs and the candidates and including Akhilesh Yadav by his own admission are appreciating that there is a certain political spectrum that is emerging in this rural area and they cannot be neglected. And therefore, I find a certain political relationship of mutual dependency between the panchayat spectrum on the one hand and the state political spectrum on the other. I expect this to take place in the urban areas a little bit more. And then also the question of numbers. I personally feel that if you release nearly three million people into the political stream of this country, and you have on the other hand 6,000 MLAs, which is the grand total of all the assemblies put together, and about, you know, 700, about, about 800 or 900 MPs, <coughs> both houses put together, Sooner or later, these people have to find some way of dividing the political turf. There is no escape. And so I expect that political compulsion to take place. Every mayor will not for long be happy to sort of, you know, uh, take a subordinate position. Now it's quite possible, and you know, all right, we are all talking among researchers and scholars here. It's quite possible that all these various political people and various others have a common bond of making money out of real estate. It's possible. But that is becoming a little unsafe. All sorts of interventions, quotes, public opinion, this, that, what not. I mean, those people are also realizing. And mind you, political leaders are also realizing that they have to maintain some distance. I mean, I would once again say, the classic case, it's much more important for a chief minister of Maharashtra and a chief minister of Andhra or a chief minister of Tamil Nadu to maintain some distance between the fortunes and misfortunes of their city. They need that political insurance because this state has sacrificed already two or three chief ministers because of their more than close involvement with the city. So from a political point of view, I look upon this as positive, saying, my God, I don't want to get involved in this. 
I must have the rest of the state to look after. That's a larger thing. The Karnataka chief minister, even good old S.M. Krishna, tried very hard to double up as chief minister and ex-officio mayor of Bangalore. He did not succeed. Chandrababu did not succeed. <clears throat> so my feeling is I look upon that as a positive feature. And then, of course, the demand from the people themselves. It may be inarticulate, uncoordinated kind of demands. And then you come to this organizational question. Therefore, I think the demand side is going to compel us to perform. It's going to compel the society to rethink. And then you come to organizational issues. I personally feel that the NCR was a very innovative approach to the problems because fairly early it was decided that the problems of Delhi have to be solved in the region, not exclusively within Delhi. Today NCR is also an economic reality in terms of various other kinds of you know, financing arrangements. You can say up to a point that these chief ministers feel NCR is how we manage to extract central government money. But fortunately, I, I look upon this as another positive feature. I mean, the finance minister's pocket is not that deep as many people think it to be. And, uh, you know, if, if, if many chief ministers start dipping into it, we will very soon find out that the poor fellow's pocket, you know, is, uh, doesn't even have a bottom. So that is another fortunate thing. So slowly you will find that people will try and put together. And therefore you find today that whatever is the transport, whether it is a good transport or bad transport, whether metro is the right answer or wrong answer. But today you are wanting UP to participate in it. You are wanting Haryana to participate in it. So people say, okay, let us, let us get into this common development framework. So in my opinion, you know, that is something. And that is where this Bombay region also becomes relevant. What is it that has to be done at the regional level, which is now not being done, and therefore will go by default? Please, go ahead. Um, my name is uh, Sudha Mohan, and I teach in the University of Mumbai. Uh, so once again, thanks uh, uh, Tan for uh, this very both provocative as well as thought-provoking uh, <coughs> presentation that you have for us. Um, this is just in continuation of what you mentioned. And uh, my question, I think, will be um, in three different trajectories. That I, and I would like you to weave in these three together, if possible. The one is, uh, is it time for us to move away from the typical colonial British relic of the past, as in having a commissioner for the cities? I mean, should cities in India necessarily follow the Bombay model of administration, if at all that has been a model at, at all? Uh, secondly, uh, I believe uh, with you, and I do very, very... Uh, I'm seriously concerned about this issue. I've written on these aspects, and that is, uh, there is a symbiotic kind of a relationship between the city and the region. And the problem is, uh, are we having policies at all which connect the city to its region? And I think, should it be mandatory henceforth, both at the local districts level, district level, as well as the state, to have policies weaving into city planning state planning in that sense, uh, issues and concerns and problems of the region. And the third point is, uh, you know, I don't think any one of us is talking about uh, social, cultural and spatial marginality. Uh, how does one actually highlight these issues together? Because I think, uh, uh, I think we need to have a response which is comprehensive because problems are interconnected. And hence, some sort of solution and alternative ought to also be integrated. So your response will be appreciated. I just wanted some comments from you on JNURM, the second phase, since you're also going to be part of that. And what do you feel about that? And obviously, there are a lot of lacunae in the first phase itself. And I don't know whether we are 
uh, addressing them in the second phase. And uh, not to take too much time because I mean, uh, but I did like that point about yours about demand side activism. And if you would like to in any way elaborate on it, because frankly speaking, we, re I mean, I mean, from the picture you've painted, it's pretty hopeless, I think. The next two decades, when the McKinsey report says we'll become half urbanized, we're just going to grapple with what kind of governance system we should have. And when the Shanghai and the Singapore of the world would be at the next level. So if you would like to have any comment on these two things, thanks. Uh, the question is about uh, what kind of a role would you envisage for the civil society to uh, sort of, you know, the, the creatures of the macro sovereigns themselves become micro sovereigns. Second phase is concerned. I really don't have a clue. None of us have a clue. All I know is that uh, there is a Kamal Nath view of Jain and Yuvara. There is a urban development ministry view, there is a Hoopa ministry view, the finance ministry view, and there is a dominating reality that there is no money. So I don't know what's going to happen with regard to JN and URM phase two. Uh, people are talking about, uh, you know, move to tier two cities, tier three cities. I for one don't know what is a tier two city, what is a tier three city, I, I do not know. I mean, if, if within the metropolitan region is, uh, I mean, is Thane tier two, uh, is Ulhasnagar tier three, uh, what is a tier three, I, I don't know. There's also the feeling that more municipalities, you know, should be covered. This is what Ishe Ravaluvali and others have said. I feel perhaps we should also seriously rethink whether we need to formally have so many of the so-called towns. You know, we have the six-fold classification, class one, class two, class three, class four, class five, class six. Incidentally, the census registrar general has said he has given the figures only for class one. He says, I am not going to give in a hurry the figures with regard to class 2, class 3 and, you know, etc., etc. This is because some, some controversies have erupted. And you must remember that the census registrar general is under the home ministry. And it's not very easy, you know, to get the home ministry's clearance before you say that this is how many people live in such and such a place. Apart from that, you know, there's another game that has been going on in our country, and that is, how do you become urban but stay rural? <laughs> because you don't pay for your power, you don't pay for various other things. It's a smart thing to do. So in Tamil Nadu, in various other places, you have settlements which are about 50,000 people. You are much better off being a panchayat. In Uttarakhand, for example, we have that absurd situation. Believe it or not, there is one municipality. Now, unless you go to Kedar Badri or some such tir, you will not even come across. This place is called Dugadda. Fortunately, it is not Dugadda. It's some other Dugadda. 1,500 people. Municipality. And so you have your State Finance Commission. The State Finance Commission distributing non-existent money among all these people. They end up by saying, you know, two paise here and four paise there. My point is, we would be much, much better off having a limited number of urban areas, urban cities, which can somehow mobilize their local resources. Because we are all agreed on one thing. Rich places, poor municipalities. This need not be so. So I'm, I don't see much of a point that you have one set of prescriptions saying rural water supply, no question of cost recovery, this, that, etc., etc. You have a set of prescriptions. The moment you become urban, and this again, 
you know there are there are many things there are many things for which uh, some of us may disagree with uh, dr jayalalitha but i certainly respect her agility because before the 2001 census you know one of the funny things that happened she declared some 600 odd settlements as urban because they used to be town panchayats town committees this that what not as a result of that briefly if you look at the 2001 census tamil nadu ranks higher than maharashtra in level of urbanization by 1.5% 2% then all these people started complaining by calling us municipal what money we could get from the panchayat raj ministry we are denied so please declassify us so she said done she declassified tamil nadu once again became less than maharashtra but those people are quite happy because they are getting money from panchayats so i think it is it is important as far as the cities are concerned and that also answers in part uh, to dr sudha mohan's question we should definitely revisit the structure definitely revisit the structure now i for one i mean it is possible i mean as 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 a former member of the ias tribe it is possible for me to delude myself to believe that i am genetically different <laughs> and i am some kind of an extraordinary human being with a rare combination of integrity and probity and skill and knowledge i now feel it is stuff and nonsense there are all sorts of political people who are equally smart and they are not waiting to be educated by me they know the situation if you study any of these scams which are being debated those scams are not born out of ignorance they are born out of deep knowledge of understanding the system and there is very little that a worthy civil servant you know could educate so i feel we have to revisit definitely the structure and i think it is better that we have a politically accountable person to head our panchayat to head our municipalities often times the question is asked about delhi now delhi by various definitions and so on and so forth is also a city state as a city state it has a mayor only thing is she does not like to be called the mayor she is called the chief minister but then the fact remains that from time to time a demand is made for her head to roll rightly or wrongly she is a politically accountable person and she is aware of that political accountability and therefore there is that motivation to get things done so i feel we need to move away you know from that now <clears throat> the other question with regard to the i think partly related to that is the demand side activism and the civil society i am not saying that it is a hopeless situation i mean my good friend sheila patel is here i think what we have to understand is it requires a long effort a lot of effort to redefine the terms of engagement between the civil society and the political establishment that is what we are talking about we are not talking about a relationship of subservience or subordination it's a question of redefining on what basis do you engage and that is not easy and that is not something that will be done only through the means of a particular project or by a particular user committee or something like that it requires multiple actions and it requires a lot of you know continuity i think as far as the uh <clears throat> the other questions with regard to the future and certainly the city and the region I mean today if you look around 
I am told now that where Hyundai is located in Chennai, it's going to be a huge automobile hub outside the Chennai metropolitan area. The Sri Perumbudur, Nokia and IT facilities outside. Now they are already talking that they have to expand the jurisdiction of the Chennai metropolitan area. The city and the region. Here once again you get into the same question. The region, what are the important tasks, who, you know, what are the important issues with regard to planning. I mean, the business development plan, for example, has given alternative growth projections. Okay, you want to go northward. You want to jump over the sea. Worley Sea Link is too short. Let us jump over it some more. Fine. You want to jump over this side of the sea. Go to Navasheva. Okay, but then these are regional questions. Who should engage in them? Only designers? Only consultants? Only professionals? only government bodies, whose job it is to provide that platform where the debate can be joined. So, if you are successful, your city and the region become very much more dynamic and therefore very much more tense. If you are not successful, you are quite happy. Then you don't have to worry about anything else. So, I am saying if, if you are talking about economic success, you will only have more problems on the city and the region and that that is something positive but there once again you know it is the same issue i entirely agree as far as social vulnerability and marginalization is concerned it is high time you know when when this telangana question was very hot and some of us in cpr was asked to you know, talk about this and give some thoughts to the Sri Krishna committee. So if you look at Hyderabad, you come to the simple conclusion that Hyderabad's economic links with the country and with the world are much more significant than its links with coastal Andhra or Rayalaseema. So Hyderabad, if it is responsible for 30% of the software exports, Hyderabad region requires a certain hybrid arrangement where it is just not a simple fiefdom of the Andhra Pradesh government. This is not to talk about a union territory. This is not to talk about secession. This is to talk about an intelligent arrangement whereby the state and the center and the umpteen other service providers and foreign institutional partners you know, can join. And, and it is quite a tough thing. Day before, we were told that you have Detroit, which is a big hole in the center. And just hardly some kilometers away, maybe about 100 kilometers, is the town of Windsor in Ontario, which is socially supposed to be vibrant. So such people who can still manage to spare some money in Detroit they go on their weekend bash to Windsor, Ontario. Partly because that they have a society which has somehow managed to withstand, you know, some of those economic problems. So I don't underestimate that question at all. And this is, you should not reduce it. Unfortunately, some of that has been reduced to some very simple equations of we versus they without realizing that once upon a time, we were also there. Yes, please. My name is Dr. Rajesh. <clears throat> Every time there are major elections in Maharashtra and Mumbai, there is an issue of uh, pro-people making Mumbai a union territory and people against it. Uh, idea of making a metro city a union territory, will, will it help the cities first? And second, these uh, 20 cities in Mumbai, Delhi, uh, industrial corridor, whether these 20 cities will be union territories or what kind of understanding it will be? I don't think the union territory is an answer at all. There is a presumption here that the union by definition is wiser. I discount that. The union is a sum total 
of the deficiencies of the states. So there's nothing inherently superior. If you take Chandigarh, Chandigarh is not Chandigarh Union territory alone. Chandigarh is Mahali, Chandigarh is Panchkula. You see, Chandigarh is Zirakpo. So the whole Chandigarh complex is a very, very important reality. And so the Union territory prescription is no answer at all. It has to be very different. And that is why as our friend here was raising the question. After all, we did devise the NCR which was pretty innovative. Why should we go back and just go back to saying Union territory? Who is this Union? So I don't think the answer lies, you know, with, with, with that. So I, I don't uh, think, I don't see that as an answer at all. That's why I'm saying hybrid. Let us think, think out of the box. It does not have to be union box, state box, and local body box. Think out of the box. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, I'm Priya Mittal, uh, student of uh, PhD of Sudha Mohan and also assistant professor in a college in Mumbai. So I'm perplexed when we talk of urban development and we look at the issue of slum dwellers, uh, where a, a clear definition of what slum actually is, slum, slums do, uh, uh, how slums are defined or how they can be defined. And in terms of uh, your, uh, your statement that slums are manifestations of lack of uh, uh, no, uh, services available to people uh, within the urban agglomerations or urban uh, uh, jurisdictions. Sir. So in this context, there is a deliberate attempt by the uh, administrations uh, in the urban areas to not uh, extend such services or facilities to uh, people who uh, we call slum dwellers because they are not legally uh, no, uh, uh, considered a part of the urban population and the administration does not hold itself accountable to them. So how do we um, meet uh, this uh, issue of uh, the increasing slums in the urban uh, areas and at the same time ensuring that there is a um, balanced development of people and population there? A couple more questions. Any more? Uh, could I ask a question here? Please, please do. Uh, there's always been talk about creating magnet towns, magnet cities, to take away the congestion from existing cities. How do you view this concept of creating magnet towns? The one time they tried to create a magnet town in Nagpur with Mihan, it was a disaster. Yeah. Okay. As far as magnets are concerned, by definition, the so-called intended <laughs> magnet should have some magnetic properties. <laughs> and that, you know, rarely happens. After independence, we built at least 120, 130 brand new greenfield towns, including the steel plant towns. I had something to do with one of them, Durgapur in West Bengal. You had various other towns. And um, in the case of Durgapur, yes, it was partly, you know, the concept of a company town. And uh, the government of India's policy at that time was that the steel plants, public sector plants, would be model employers. And they should provide womb to tomb services for their employees. And so as a result, the general manager of the Durgapur steel plant had to spend very much more time about the design of the primary schools and the parks and the cattle and this and that and so on and so forth, you see. And all these were sort of company towns. And they all had their type designs. I was quite fond of saying that all these type designs look pretty much the same. So unless you kept a dog, you would not be able to locate your own flat. The dog would smell it for you. Because they all looked the same. Okay? Now, B.C. Roy made a, 
made a very candid observation during one of the meetings. He said, you see, in Bengal our problem has been that capital was British, labor was Bihar, and the Bengali has been the Babu. And therefore, Durgapur is a challenge whereby I want to bring the Bengali face to face, close to the rigors of an industrial society. And he said that this is what I wanted. And Durgapur was pretty sterile. But, I mean, talking about magnetism, there were a lot of open spaces between the different townships. And each township, you know, had its own boundary. And these spaces in between were considered as uh, not the responsibility of the industries. That's where the slums came. Fortunately, in one part of Durgapur, you know, we could negotiate with uh, Hindustan Steel and they agreed to give back some land and that has now become the city center of Durgapur. So in the city center of Durgapur, you have your coffee day, you have your pizza hut, you have your disco, you have your cinema house, you have your hotels, and there is this highway, and now people are saying, why Calcutta? Why not Durgapur? Today, Bilai and Drug is acquiring some mass. So is Raurkela. So it takes a certain amount of time for this magnetism to develop. So I have no problem at all. L let us have as many such opportunities as, as possible. So, but I'm not very sure that that will take people away from the existing centers because the numbers are so huge. With a little bit of luck, I mean, in a way, even Navi Mumbai in some respect, when Bain de Sousa and Sirish were talking about it, was supposed to draw away. What is happening today? Your Mumbai metropolitan region, of which Navi is a part, is, is, is all growing. So far, so good. So my point is the same thing is happening with regard to some of these, you know, various other new settlements. In a way, the census towns which I was talking about, they were also these nodes of magnetism, you know, which is, which is taking people. They are not taking people away from the existing city. They are alternative loci. In regard to slums, that's an unanswered question. You know, this is one of those things which we have discussed, we have talked about, starting from Jawaharlal Nehru's plain irritation. Because he did not understand it, he felt very uncomfortable. And therefore he merely said, it's a blot on the nation. And that, you know, we should not allow it to exist. He did not contribute much, very frankly. He was only irritated. But, there was also a time during 1970s when we felt that slums are a part of the housing stock of a city and that we somehow have to conserve it and therefore this environmental improvement of slums, that movement went on 70s, early 80s in Indian cities, in Asian cities, in Latin American cities. But later on, we seem to have changed our view. Today we are talking about putting the slum land to better use. Now, I want to respectfully submit that you cannot talk in the same breath about monetization of land as a resource instrument and inclusive growth and accommodating slums at the same time. It's a contradiction which, which one has to resolve. And I don't think the answer lies in legality. Unfortunately, you know, we have a high density of lawyers in this country. 
and whenever we can't find a solution to a problem, we rush to the court and we get hit, you know, for quite often. Bombay was the city which came up with this fantastic judgment in Olga Telly's case, where the Bombay High Court said that a payment dweller's right to livelihood is intimately connected with his right to life and they defined it as a fundamental right and that was Olga Telly's case here in Bombay. Today, we have moved away. Today, we are concentrating on gentrification, on legality, on legitimacy. And we find that legal legitimacy is more important than spatial reality. I'm not taking sides here. I'm only pointing out that we have these unanswered conflicts in our mind. And if we don't answer them, we are not likely to be finding an answer. I, you know, people cast their eyes on Dharavi about 25 years ago. The fact that Dharavi still is there, defying all great designers of urban space, is a tribute to their endurance. So, I mean, where does the answer lie? So it would seem to me, across the world once again, very interesting to see what is happening in, in Rio de Janeiro in the context of the Olympic Games. I mean, you know, Sheila and some others may know that. Okay, uh, some attempt to see is it possible that we sort of co-opt the slum population into this, uh, you know, capital accumulation uh, scenario. Uh, I would say that uh, I, I don't think legality is the, uh, should be the issue. And if legality is the issue, that shows a very limited understanding of the problem. Can we take the last question? Yes, yes please. I'm Ashok Data. I'm just arising what we are saying. I observe the two things that are happening. One second. Mr. Especially Data? One second. Just taking up the same point just a little further what we have observed about the slums and other things, that last 10 or 20 years, especially in Mumbai and perhaps in all other cities also, the gap between incomes and the cost of real estate has been widening more and more. Cost which is sub Cost between income and the cost of real estate. Okay, yeah. That has been happened, even was pointed out as one of the basic flaw in American system, where the median income to median housing price ratio got destabilized between 2006-2007 and that is the kind of a housing bubble burst. I was wondering, coupled with that, I mean, of course, uh, we have got a greater inequality in terms of a cost of living or cost of uh, income, I mean, incomes and the cost of housing. As well, coupled with the internet revolution, then there is no need to have the workplace addresses together in cities. So whether do you think that whatever has happened so far may or may not happen in the future in terms of the development of urban cities of commercial engines of growth where the real estate prices are falling and are re I mean commercial uh, uh, prices are falling and real estate uh, resale prices are going up and a lot of kind of a this economy is. so what would you say about this? You see I'm not very sure you know there, there was this belief that uh, your workplace in physical terms is going to be less and less relevant and that workplaces can be anywhere and it does not require a physical concentration with all the you know so-called negative externalities of that. Uh, about uh, 20 years ago there were a whole series of studies you know in, in many countries across the world by scholars about the impending uh, what shall I say, uh, um, uh, disappearance of this workplace-based city. But somehow that does not seem to take place as yet. As yet, there are s demand for so many other services which are not satisfied only through the internet. There are so many other things. And therefore, you know, your 
uh, economies of scale agglomeration etc etc continue to continue to operate as far as the price ratios are concerned i think in a way uh, this has been the classical model particularly followed in in, in western countries were increasing the price of land and creating a certain value which could be a means of capital accumulation that has been a classical approach in certain other societies in europe that has been somewhat tempered in some societies that has been untempered i do not know what is going to be you know the the case the case in this in this country but i am not i somehow feel that notwithstanding the internet revolution the need for a physical workplace as a city will remain and the pricing of real estate yes as i said the pricing of real estate is part of it's not that the market will find an answer it's unlikely to find an answer thank you sir thank you for this wonderful talk this insightful talk can we give him a hand and to the request of colleague to offer him a small payment of appreciation thank you sir thank you very much thank you thank you very much thank you sir thank you